welcome everybody or thanks so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Jose Barzola. I'm with the Montana Institute for Peace here. Uh, welcome to our Building a Nuclear Free World talk story um, and brought to you by uh, the Montana Institute. Uh, our talk story today is on lessons from Hiroshima atomic bomb survivors, the documentary screening uh, called Hibakusha and Legacy for Peace with filmmaker uh, Joy Lacaninta and uh, moderated by myself. Uh, thank you for joining us today to learn about the tragic impact of nuclear bombs. Our talk story is part of the Building a Nuclear Free World exhibit currently available at the Hamilton Library Bridge Gallery at the University of Hawaii at Manoa till the end of April. Uh, that's hosted uh, not only on behalf of the National Nagasaki Memorial Hall for the atomic bomb victims, as well as the Hiroshima Atomic Bomb Museum, as well as us at the Matsunai Institute. Uh, with the continuous threat of nuclear devastation around the world, learning about and working to build a nuclear-free world has never been timelier. Um, Building a Nuclear-Free World actually continues the Matsunai Institute's long engagement with public outreach on the nuclear threat which began in 1995 with the 50th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We mounted an exhibition for 50 years with the bomb, and then again uh, in 2018, and then in 2020 when it was 75 years since the bombing. Uh, in addition to viewing the exhibition, you've also invited to attend Senator Matsunaga's portion of the exhibit on peace and the ever urgent need to build a nuclear free world. Uh, we are having uh, countless activities uh, during the two months that the exhibit's been open, uh, which we hope you'll be continuing to join us in. Uh, today, thank you for joining us for a premiere of a teaser documentary on Hibakusha a Legacy for Peace. This film is a part of a longer documentary research project focusing on the lived experiences of Hiroshima atomic bomb survivors after the attack on August 6, 1945. More importantly, the documentary project examines their lifelong advocacy role in anti-war and nuclear disarmament on a global scale. Our filmmaker is Joy Lacaninta, who has over 29 years background in community organizing and advocacy. She's an alumni actually right here from our graduate certificate in conflict resolution. So it's always wonderful to bring back uh, our community and spotlight some of the great work they're doing. She's also one of our lecturers or affiliate faculty here in teaching a couple courses for us. Uh, as a filmmaker, she also produced a documentary about the plight of domestic workers in Hawaii and was selected to take part in the Hawaii Governor's Task Force on Community Campaign Awareness for the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights. Um, congratulations on that. Uh, she also directed and produced Unsheltered Crimes, a documentary about the criminalization of poverty by incarcerating the unsheltered population of Hawaii. So once more, thank you for bringing a spotlight to some of these issues that many times don't make it beyond the islands. Uh, her academic background is from transdisciplinary fields combining sociology, women's studies, ethnic studies, peace studies, communications, public policy, and administration. Her research interests include women's rights, particularly issues relating to <clears throat> criminalization of poverty, aging, gender-based violence, indigenous perspectives on social justice, transformation, and social issues affecting immigrant, migrant, and displaced indigenous communities. So thank you for being here today. Greatly appreciate your time. Uh, to get us started, I'm going to turn it over to you to give a little background about the documentary, then we'll show the documentary, and then we'll go into some dialogue Q&A. And for anyone who's joining us today, please feel free to use the chat to uh, add any kind of questions you may have, and we'll get to them uh, later during the Q&A section. Thank you. Aloha, everyone. My name is Joy Lacanienta, and thank you very much to the Matsunaga Institute, particularly Jose, for featuring the documentary. It's still a work in progress. I'm trying to... Um, still interview uh, one of the people who is a Nobel Peace Prize winner um, for her work in, in nuclear free campaigns um, in terms of uh, particularly sharing her experience as a Hibaksha from Hiroshima as well. So um, this project was actually um, part of a summer program in Japan between the University of Hawaii with the peace uh, Matsunaga Institute for Peace, as well as uh, the University, uh, City University of Hiroshima. Um, they, they had an exchange program, so to speak, um, and a collaboration. So we went there in 2019 to film, and I got to meet some of the wonderful um, activists, and most of them were Hibaksha. Um, they're at a certain age at this point. They were children when they experienced World War II, and now they're in their 80s or late 80s. So I thought, and I was inspired by 
making sure that their stories are preserved because I, I believe that they have a legacy um, and their legacy is for peace. That's why it became the title. Um, it is a very much um, effort of love type of work. And I'm really glad to be able to share it with you today. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Jose. Thank you, I will. All right, we're gonna get started on video. I think Hiroshima was very vivid and clear. Of course, happy days. We were beautiful kimono. And when we had that festival, we got up and the mother prepared delicious food the day of festival. Father was busy. He was one of the main member of the shrine to prepare festival. I used to go there and they saw the shrine dance, especially we love New Year's days. So always we wear kimono, you know, and only New Year's days until the fifth, we could stay very late until 10 o'clock or so. We sang together songs. That's a good memory. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. With this bomb, we have now added a new and revolutionary increase in destruction to supplement the growing power of our armed forces. In their present form, these bombs are now in production, and even more powerful bombs are in development. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. The force from which the sun draws its power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. We have spent more than $2 billion on the greatest scientific gamble in history, and we have won. But the greatest marvel is not the size of the enterprise, its secrecy, or its cost, but the achievement of scientific brains in making it work. The statement, which was released in the White House because the President Truman was in the, in the middle of the ocean. He was on his way back to the United States. So statement and as a newspaper coverage, these are the only information source for people. <laughs> Actually, no one knew about that bombing. So they were easily to control the image, people's opinion about that bombing because the statement and the New York Times newspaper article are the only news source, only information source. And many newspaper articles were written by one New York Times reporter, William Lawrence. So he was able to control how people conceive the image of atomic bomb. For example, in American perspective or, or narrative of atomic bombing is from the military side, end it the war, save the war, save the lives. But the Japanese, especially the people in Hiroshima, they were victims. They, at least they suffered physical and psychological, every kind of you know, suffering they experienced. That is not a war ender. That is extinguish everything, right? So quite different. 
As a matter of fact, in order to gauge how far the percentage of people were killed after the nuclear attack, the United States specifically studied school children. And they used that to extrapolate what was the general level of mortality at one kilometer, two kilometers, three kilometers. So they were well aware that they were counting dead children by the thousands as a means of understanding the impact of the weapon. So the notion that you needed a massive attack against the civilian population with a weapon of mass destruction as a critical military step is an explanation that's offered for public consumption. And the United States wanted to, first of all, demonstrate it had a weapon, and second of all, understand exactly what the capacity of that weapon was. In the late 1930s, and early 1940s, when governments were thinking about nuclear weapons, it was kind of impossible for them to quite grasp what the capacity of these weapons were. But they understood that in the future, it would be essential to have weapons like that if any other nation did. So there was a race to build these weapons because there was certainly the sense that whoever had the best nuclear arsenal had the possibility of being the dominant power globally. It was clear during the Manhattan Project that these were weapons that had the capacity to destroy all of life on Earth. When a nuclear weapon explodes, there's several types of radiation that are experienced as a result of the explosion, and they have different effects that are dire at different times. So when the weapon detonates, there's a burst of gamma radiation. For the nuclear weapon here in Hiroshima, it extended about three kilometers in all directions. Those gamma rays penetrate almost everything through buildings, through our entire bodies. It can do incredible amounts of damage if you would receive a, a large amount of gamma radiation. The weapon also creates quite a lot of radioactive fallout. This is in the form of beta particles and alpha particles. However, plutonium remains dangerous for over 200,000 years. Once they are put into the ecosystem, they simply move around through the ecosystem. You can't really change them. For example, in Hanford, Washington, where the U.S. manufactured most of its plutonium for nuclear weapons, there's uh, 177 tanks full of radioactive waste, all of which are leaking. This is 75 years later. We have not yet figured out adequate ways to manage or contain this waste. This is just one location. There's locations all around the world where there's been a massive introduction of radioactive fallout. And once that has happened, those particles migrate through the ecosystem. The implosion bomb at Nagasaki was large and round. The gun design bomb that was used here in Hiroshima is smaller and long. So that was Little Boy and the big round one was Batman. The United States often describes the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor as a justification for the nuclear attacks in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Needless to say, that's just crazy. And in Pearl Harbor, you have an attack by a military on a military base. They didn't attack Honolulu. They attacked Pearl Harbor. Now, that's a terrible thing, but that's something that's understood as an act of war. To use a weapon of mass destruction against a civilian population, that's a war crime. Uh, as heinous as the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor may have been, it, it's completely disconnected from the Hiroshima attack. The cities of Japan, for example, Hiroshima, at that time, almost all of the males were off at war. Hiroshima was a city of elderly children and women. Two days before the bombing and uh, was my, my birthday, August the 4th. So that means I was seven years old until that time. I was alone because my father and, uh, stopped me to go to school. He was sure a kind of foreboding inspiration he had. Without any warning, there was a strong flash. Everything I was seeing turned to white. No color at all. Soon after that, there was a strong blast, and I was beaten on the road and became unconscious. I was blacked out. When I opened my eyes, everywhere was just dark. I couldn't see anything. Because of the suit and the sand, the pieces of debris fell on me. I couldn't bleed. And I returned home. My house was messy. And some wounded people came and they stayed overnight in my house. And the blood was going through store. 
couldn't use the bedding because the wounded people and the dying people were here. The sun was showing in the, the scar, the internal organ or so. So I had to see them because I couldn't go anywhere inside my house, outside of my house, my neighborhood. People were dying. That's uh, the start of my trauma, you know, because I saw many people I couldn't help. And uh, I was a little girl, but still every day I saw people were dying. There was nothing to do for them. And I wondered that why people are dying, somebody who didn't have any scars, no burned. And I was talking with one of my neighbors or friend until a day before yesterday, but all of a sudden she died without having any scars and no all burned. Every day the experience was like that. And uh, many survivors blame themselves why we survived because many lost their family. Some of them people tried to pull them out under the crash and building, but the secondary fire reached and knowing their children still alive, but they escaped. Then they blamed themselves almost all. My friends, my relatives, they regret why I left at that time. I was so cruel. Why I survived, why I lived. It's an unbearable experience for an eight years old girl. And so many people suffered so many years, not only visible scars, like us invisible scars we have. So people should know what the nuclear weapon means. And uh, there is a tendency Japanese people do not want to tell what happened in their family and they try to hide. And always they were so, uh, so sad and they try to smile. In my family, we couldn't talk what happened those days because they keep silent. Memory was so severe. We did not, so 50 years, I didn't tell about my story. We survivors have to tell something not seen in the museum. Through our talk, people can understand how we have suffered. The Hibakusha's story just could make you cry, make you very emotional. Emotion is very important because uh, sooner or later, there is uh, no Hibakusha. I wanted to visit. I want to sing. I want to comfort the soldiers. I was so little, and the soldier's bed was so high like this. And he was sleeping, and then he was so happy. The soldier was so happy. He was wounded and then lie on the bed, but I was so small. And uh, do you want me to sing a song? Inochi o shimanu yokare no danazu botan wa sakura ni kari kyo mo tobu tobu kasumi ga ura nya this song was sung by 18 years old young soldiers holding me. I remember that quite well. And uh, still now, I can sing. I know, I remember.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, your your work in in this field. Um, I imagine it's not um, an 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 easy you know uh, area to. I um I I have a couple of questions, but the first one that actually kind of comes to mind, uh, I just from your bio and also from just watching this documentary, you're constantly putting yourself uh, or leaning into your discomfort as we talk about, you know, spotlighting some of the issues that are affecting our community that many times aren't spoken about, that are challenging ones, but are definitely also important to continue to do. Um, how do you do it? I mean, or how do you, I imagine it takes a lot of energy to, you know, focus, be present in these challenging issues of life. Uh, how do you practice self-care? How do I practice self-care? Well, um, I, well, because I, I also teach peace studies, <laughs> part of that is taking care of your inner peace. So um, I teach my students how to do self-care, practicing meditation, you know, daily affirmations. I also teach guided uh, meditation. So to keep you centered. But I think that what sustains me even more is making sure that some of the stories that we would not regularly hear, um, some of the voices that are either silenced or unrepresented in, in a more mainstream stage um, should be heard and must be heard lest we forget and repeat that same mistake in our now growing global society, right? So I think that that's an important um, point of view, I believe. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a couple other ones here, but uh, also for the audience, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to add it to the chat. Um, uh, what are the significant historical realizations uh, that you came across uh, about the attack on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Yes, when I was, um, this is primarily a, a research project too, right? So it's a hermeneutic research project because of the nuclear free campaign um, and that is still alive today. So I was very much touched by the stories of the Hibakusha, particularly the personal stories, um, the way that they saw and, and remembered um, Hiroshima, the before Hiroshima, the, the, the wonderful, vibrant community that they had, how strong their community was, how loving the community was, and all of a sudden it was gone in an instant. One morning you are there, one morning, your family is a complete unit. One morning, your friends are absolutely, you know, looking forward to seeing you at school. And then the next, it's not. So that is a startling realization as I was talking to them, because when they're talking about their stories, it was very real. It was quite visceral. And no matter how many times they've told their stories, there's still moments where they just, you catch them looking on the side and they're there in the moment. So it's a very much intergenerational trauma that um, has perpetuated through our history. The other thing that I, I was so shocked about, um, not really shocked, but the fact that the United States knew um, that it was going to happen. And it's at the, at the tail end of World War II. Um, I think one of the professors mentioned um, that I interviewed that uh, two weeks before Harry Truman issued that famous film clip, right, that they did it because they had no other choice but to defend America and defend freedom. They knew two weeks before then because of the letters that um, was scratched out and I included that in the documentary because within those two weeks they could have warned the civilian population of Hiroshima that it was coming. They could have evacuated the entire town, not just Hiroshima, but also Nagasaki. I mean, the death toll could have been avoided if the United States wanted to make uh, a, a statement 
about how powerful they are. Um, they definitely targeted, and, and the way the professor mentioned it, um, is that it is targeted towards children. They used, um, what do you call this? Schools. One of them is the Honkawa School, which is at the epicenter, you know, ground zero. They started from there. So for a country to target civilian populations is an act of, you know, it's a crime of war. You know, it's it's uh, it's it's basically we were on the bad side of this history, and yet you don't hear this the narrative that the United States has won the war, you know, we have prevented the evil people from invading and ruling over the world. I'm not saying that Japan was uh, innocent in all this. However, the people were, the civilians were innocent, you know, and at that time, um, without any warning, the United States mentioned that there were, they provided leaflets. Um, they dropped leaflets. However, the juxtaposition of where those leaflets were um, distributed were in farms. So there were no people there when the leaflets fell. And then following that, um, so there was no way for, for everyone to be able to evacuate, especially the fact that they knew it was going to happen. The announcement was supposed to go out in July, but they prevented that from happening until after the bombs were released and the devastation happened. So those were amazing to me and not in a good sense that, you know, me as an American citizen, um, it, it's unconscionable, you know, that this has happened um, first and foremost. And the way that the narrative is being played out to this day, because this is a great source of shame for the people, um, in the Japanese community, not only in Japan, but also in Hawaii, because we have a thriving Japanese community here. Not only Issei, Nisei, Sensei, you know, generations, and even more. Um, they're looking at this as like, we're always at fault, you know. They have taken accountability. Um, if you go around Hiroshima, they have made that place into a living testament of what we should not do. And everyone is very much into um, the propagation of peace and how we could live a nuclear free world. And I think that's a positive way that we can take accountability for that the United States can learn from this. Um, one other thing that I thought was unbelievable is about the radioactive fallout. Um, to this day, Hiroshima has some level of radioactive because it, you know we've only been there for like 1946. Yeah, so radio fallout lasts for hundreds and hundreds of years, and the ramifications of that. So when we are talking about intergenerational trauma, this is very much the very example of what intergenerational trauma that is palpable in terms of people's health, in terms of people's memories, in terms of people's um, spirit, you know. So with, with that happening, I think that we should really learn from this, this lesson. No, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I completely completely concur with you i'm going to add to the chat just a link to uh i, I imagine you've uh heard uh, professor hallett's whole talk on uh the atomic bomb myth uh saving lives ending the war which is a big statement uh and, and rationale that has been said countlessly and many historical books you know justifies the use of the atomic bombing to end the war uh, but uh, his his talk actually counters that. So if anyone in the audience wants to uh, watch his talk, it, it, there is a link to the recording for that. Um, but the, the reality is like, if, if someone were to acknowledge this myth, then the reality is that for all the countries that have bombs, it's it's just a weapon of destruction. There's no, no means to why it should be used. And that is something that um, 
I don't think anyone would ever truly acknowledge because for, for the challenges uh, it could they could face, you know, as a nation. Um, a little bit about the background for developing this documentary. Uh, how much research uh, went into putting together the historical components of this film? I imagine it was not an easy task. It looks like in the end you brought these research from a lot of different locations. Yes, um, the filming in Hiroshima um, was very intense uh, almost every day. Um, and it, it, we don't have a full crew. <laughs> Basically, it was me and two volunteers, mainly my children. <laughs> so um, that's what you get when you have a community organizer as a mom and an educator. So they were very much in it with me and they learned a great deal, which is um, amazing. But um, I was able to go to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. because some of the um, some of the footage, it, it cannot be downloaded. It, you have to get special permission to, to get those. So I went to the Army archives. I went to the Air Force archives. I went to specific archives that only certain folks, like, for example, that letter from Truman, that's not common knowledge, right? That they knew two weeks before. That's kind of like, oops, we let that out. So I had to get special permission to get that draft of the letter where he crossed out July and put August instead. I thought that that was very, very key to let people know the truth, right? So that took hours and hours to to in, in Washington DC to to go through that. Um, I owe a debt of gratitude to the Hiroshima Peace Museum, to the Honkawa Elementary School. Um, I actually went to those places where it's in the epicenter to get those footage. All of the footage that you saw of the archive um, are from the Hiroshima Peace Museum and uh, Honkawa Elementary School um, and other um, local community photographs and footage like personal family footage of there was one towards the end of this man that was saying goodbye and it survived the atomic uh, bomb it was one of the last things that survived and his family donated that one piece because that's the only thing they had of him he went to war after that so the stories behind those things, it gives me, you know, I'm local, so chicken skin, so to speak, because it's real. These are real people that went through that. Um, I particularly like the way that they were talking about, you know, um, going through the cherry blossoms and whatnot, and even the song, you know, if you translated the song that Ogura-san was singing it's a really horrendous song about being um you know a fighter um fighter jet uh the uh, they call them warriors but it, it it's it's a soldier committing kamikaze but the the tone was very much taught to children and, and it was like it, it's a very complex situation where some of their fond memories are skewed because those are their only memories. They were already at war, right? I mean, World War II lasted from, it started like um, the tensions began in 1938. So these were their formative years. And so their memories of it, their, even their fond memories of their childhood is colored by the war. So to think about it, they didn't really have a real childhood, you know? So we forget that because now when we're hearing them, they're in their eighties, you know, mid eighties, but the, they were like 11 years old, eight years old when this was happening, this tragedy was happening. So getting all those research um, and footage from actual family members, um, from actual folks that were like, here, here's a picture of my aunt, or this was a picture of me and my cousins. They're all dead, by the way, because of the war. I mean, I mean, th there's a glimmer of happiness followed by an immediate devastation. So those were very powerful for me. And it took at least a good eight months of 
digging through the files and collecting all of that information. That's why it's still not done. <laughs> I have four more stories to go, yeah, three more stories to go. Wonderful. I, I, we, we look forward to uh, when, when time allows. Uh, <laughs> um, what are some of the, would you say, are some of the uh, lasting impacts of Hiroshima to our global society, uh, both good and bad? I, as I mentioned earlier, I think um, the way the Japanese society, you know, the Japanese community, particularly the Hiroshima folks, have um, embraced accountability in their part of World War II, as well as they've dedicated their entire city as a remembrance of what not to do, you know, of wonder resilience. Um, is, is an amazing testament on how we should move forward as a global community. That's the good part of it. Um, everyone is educated about the mistakes of Japan during World War II and how to take accountability for it. Every year they have a remembrance of the atomic bomb. Um, and, and it's very touching to see the lanterns floating, kind of like our Memorial um, Day lantern um, event in uh, in Honolulu, um, and every year that happens. So this yearly commemoration um, in Japan, and then this daily reminder. They left the Honkawa Elementary School like that, you know, just standing so that we not forget this. Now on the bad side, um, folks who are still living near Hiroshima. Um, are risking their lives on a daily basis because of the radio radioactive fallout, right? But they refuse to leave because it's their home and they have, they have a right to live in that home. So the ramifications of that, some of the, it, it's the nuclear testings that the United States has done after, okay, the Manhattan Project, after the atomic bomb, um, display of the United States power um, in Nagasaki and Hiroshima um, is really unnecessary. You know, it's detrimental. And if you listen to some of the warnings of the researchers that has dedicated their lives in terms of the nuclear studies, is that it can end the world. It literally can end the world. And we have enough problems like climate change you know, um, injustices that we are all going through, that this is something that we need to pay attention. Um, and yes, going back to you, Jose, in terms of, do you have other questions? And No, thank you, thank you. Um, I think uh, you, you bring up some really great points, especially, uh, I mean, it's, we, we talk about perspectives and education and how, you know, what are we learning? And um, many, many times what we're learning is the stories of those that, you know, did the colonizing, those that won the wars and, and many times, uh, so it kind of beckons the question about the information that's being brought in. Uh, so thank you for, you know, delving through the research. Um, how, how is the tragedy in Hiroshima related to what's going on today with current events, would you say? I, I would say that, um, well, let's step a, a little bit back, not with just current events, but also what has happened, as I mentioned, in the United States, particularly in the islands. Um, Kaho'olawe is where the United States um, tested nuclear bombs, right? To the point that no one in Hawaii can go to that, um, that part of our islands because it's of the radioactive fallout. It's radioactive. If you go there, you would, you know, you're risking your health. Um, so it's off limits. And by, by the way, it's Kaholavi is one of our sacred places, you know, as Filipino and Pacific Islander, um, your culture being tied to the Aina, to the land, that that is an affront to your culture, to your way of belief system. And yet the United States went and did that. Um, the United States government, basically. 
The other part of it is the other testing set no one knows about, like the Bikini Islands. The atolls are literally falling apart, not just um, because of the um, nuclear testings. You know, we have the Compact of Free Association. The reason why there's COFA is because the United States not only invaded them, but you know, did this atomic bomb testing in a lot of the islands to the point that to this day, we're seeing um, people from the Micronesian community, um, the Compact of Free Association states, Chukis, Marshallese, as well as the, you know, um, Pompeii, um, Yapis, um, all of these different countries are affected by this, Palau, um, because of the nuclear um, radioactive fallouts, people have severe health issues. Um, babies were born as jelly babies. I don't know if anyone has heard of that, but children are born without limbs, heads, just basically a heart, and they die upon giving birth. Women have breast cancer. A lot of folks have thyroid problems. And because they're living in these atolls. And that's why the United States had to develop a compact of free association, partly because of what they've done. But we don't hear that, right? Um, we don't know the lasting impact of it. We don't hear it in the news. You might hear like a, a small documentary film talking about it or, you know, but you don't see that on a daily basis that these people are basically subjected to these um, horrible conditions. Um, and by like 2050, some of the atolls are gonna be gone, not just because of climate change, but because of the ramifications of the radioactive fallout, as well as atomic bomb testing, making the land useless. Um, and so that's the death of the culture and the community, if you're thinking about it, because you're displacing entire cultures, entire communities because of that. And to the current events, everyone has heard and everyone is feeling the inflation from the war between Russia and Ukraine. Um, and also the issues that um, North Korea and Kim Jong-un could just very itchy fingers going into the nuclear codes and whatnot, the threat. Um, so, you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist. You just have to be a realist that it can happen, you know, because unless we make it illegal globally not to make any type of nuclear um, weapons of mass destruction, because that's all it is. It's a weapon of mass destruction. It's unnecessary. And, and for what? What is the purpose? We need to ask those questions, really pointed questions and push them in terms of answering that is it worth it to do this? The answer is clear. You don't need a PhD to tell you this is not conducive to a healthy lifestyle for a healthy global environment, for a healthy society to function with nuclear threat looming over our heads, like the way the Hirosh folks from Hiroshima, Nagasaki had experienced, people from Chernobyl experienced, you know. Thank you so much. Um, just want to remind our audience, if there's any questions, please to add it to the chat. We have a few minutes still left. Uh, otherwise, I'll just keep asking questions. Um, why? Um, Hi, Kat, you have a question? Hi, Kat. Kat's uh, there. Here, well, uh, you can unmute. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're, un you're muted. No, no, she should be able to unmute herself now. OK, good. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to thank you, Joy, for making this film and for telling the truth. I think this is really, really important. I know for me, I was at a No Nukes March maybe 30 years ago, and one of the most powerful things was a group from um, Hiroshima, a group of women, and it was something that left such an imprint on my heart. It was like, 
why would we even ever consider doing anything like this anywhere? It's just so unconscionable. So I really appreciate that you you dug and you found the letter from Truman and you, you know, that you actually you shined a light on the truth. And I think now it's more important than ever <laughs> because we live in an era of such incredible chaos where, you know, the truth is so suspect. If I hear another person tell me I don't believe in science, I'm like, <laughs> I don't even know how to respond to that. So, <laughs> so I, I just really appreciate you. And of course, Jose, I just always love seeing you. <laughs> You're just such a great asset to our community, as is, you know, the Institute for Peace. So thank you so much. And Joy, I'm so proud of you. You're so... <laughs> You're amazing and you're doing 29 things at once. I <laughs> you're yeah. incredible and you're and involving your kids. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't uh, maybe we could share the the link of the film because I don't think the music was showing and uh, or at least on my end I couldn't hear it and there were some lags. So um we'll share it on the chat. Oh, good. Okay. Um so that folks can watch the full thing. My daughter did the she's in the Okay, I'm going to be a proud mama for a second. She's Good. in the Carnegie <laughs> Hall of Royal Conservatory of Music at the last stage. Um, so she did the um, um, the music or the, the sound effects for it. Um, and she actually did a lot of research um, in terms of what is the appropriate tonality. You know, she went to some of the... Um, Shishonji Temple in, in Japan. She went to the Myohoji Temple to just listen to the way the rhythm of uh, the gong um, and the bells. Of, you know, it's just a, an amazing thing to involve my children in this. Um, to what you mentioned, um, Kat, um, Oppenheimer, the, the person who is usually credited for the Manhattan Project, deeply regretted deeply regretted his involvement in this. He actually quoted the Bhagavad Gita um, in terms of now I have become destroyer of worlds. And we are repeating that same mistake. You know, um, he never bounced back from that experience, especially after he saw what happened to Hiroshima, what happened to Nagasaki. And he knew way into the 60s that we were doing these atomic bomb testings in the Pacific Islands. And he and Albert Einstein at the time were fighting against that. They were really campaigning to stop it. Mm -hmm. but They were silenced and, and all that. So, well, it, it was a, a very interesting thing to also, you know, see the humanity behind it of, how brilliant, something so brilliant of an idea that can help humanity can be turned into something that can destroy it. Yes. So I, I thought that those were some of the realizations that I had. Um, I really, really search for an, a, a redeeming value of why the United States had to go through this. Um, there were a lot of smoke and daggers in terms of saying, oh, there is a real you know, Asian threat or, and all that stuff. It, it wasn't. We, we were the threat. Yes. It, it was our decision yeah. that could have been avoided. Yeah. Yeah. And now that um, we're not just fearing, I mean, atomic bombs, we're fearing something larger than that that can eliminate entire nations, you know, and depending on where it's, um, I think um, the assessment of the atomic bomb is if it was dropped in New York, you would feel it all the way down to New England, I believe, <laughs> you know, so it's it's that big, you know, and now with with even more powerful nuclear weapons, it can easily eliminate US and Canada, 
you know, if yeah. we're if, if it was dropped in the East, East Coast. With North Korea, it's a definite threat to Hawaii because we're closer to North Korea. And um, well, Donald Trump didn't succeed in having a really good relationship with Kim Jong-un so, so it's, it's a very interesting situation because you know he keeps threatening us with with a nuclear war yeah <laughs> for your comment though thank you I really appreciated that affirmation Just sending you guys lots of love thank you thank you Jose? I just wanted to share with the audience uh there is a uh, something called a nuke map. There's a website of it. You can actually select any place on Earth and click on it, um, and it'll show you exactly what the impact of a nuclear bomb would be. Cool. Uh, it's yes, it's scary that it exists, but simultaneously, I think it provides uh, for those that are visual learners a, a true visual impact. You know, who might seem like, oh, Japan, it's so far away. You know, test out your local neighborhood and see. You know how much devastation would be done. Um, there's there's lots of resources out there. Um, I, I was gonna. Well, there's nothing wrong with being a proud mom or a proud parent. So keep at it. Keep <laughs> nurturing them in so many ways. Uh, so great to see. May, maybe there'll be a soundtrack down the road. <laughs> All four yeah. sections get completed. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Um, I was gonna just uh, share how like it is so one of the things you've kind of been alluding to but we haven't really talked about so much is like separating the people from those in power from those in government uh you know it's it's a uh, it's i i really think it's it's the power aspect of the human or, or of the, those the government those societies that you know why continue to build why because from conversations I've had with, you know, communities in Japan and other places of the world, like people just want to live their lives, just go about their routines. They're not, you know, your local neighbor normally is not concerned about like, oh, can we um, increase the amount of land that this country has? Like, they just want to live their lives and, you know, raise their kids. And uh, it's, it's not, that complicated, but unfortunately, when it comes to levels of power, um, it's, I, I always look back at like this pandemic that, I mean, it's ever ongoing, but slowly we're coming out of it. Uh, how the world kind of came together for a few moments, you know, to uh, search for a cure. Can you imagine if we practice that on a more common basis, how much more we could actually achieve? as yeah. opposed to the ego and the I, and what am I gonna make out of? I mean, I, I know there's profit being made out of this vaccine, but still like just the 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 initial ask of like people coming together for a cause, it was, it was really beautiful. Uh, and I, I hope that, um, you know, hopefully we have learned something, fingers crossed <laughs> as we move forward. Um, but one of my last questions I have for you is, uh, what words of wisdom do you have for aspiring filmmakers, since you have a couple <laughs> of videos under your belt already with awards? Um, I think being led with passion and compassion are two things that really sustains me through the sleepless nights. Um, when you have passion for the topic, the social issue, and a sense of social justice, you don't have to know it all, <laughs> you know, part of the beauty of doing film is learning through the process. You know, in, in my classes, the way, I mean, I'm plugging my peace studies class, you know, um, <laughs> at the Matsunaga Institute. Um, my students learn from community service learning. And that's my approach. Um, and, you know, some other professors are starting to do that. As well, um, they have to volunteer in the community, learning how to do it, and they have to do a mini film themselves, like seven to eight minutes of their interviews. You know, that's their final project. This is something that they can take for the rest of their lives and learn from. And if you have that, I mean, it's different from when you write a paper to actually 
seeing the fruit of your labor, you know, and I'm a big believer as a, um, as a researcher and as a sociologist and peace studies educator that, um, you know, when you have a point a, a, and you care about a social issue that you put it in a, in a level of um, allowing your subjects to speak about what they care about the most, it has a better impact. It has a longer impact. Um, for this particular film, I thought that the Hibakshas, the survivors of the atomic bomb, had a very specific and unique experience that they can teach the world, you know, um, besides of like what Kat mentioned, the uh, uh, Hiroshima maidens that were, they were displayed throughout um, the United States. Um, it was an effort. There was a, the good intention was to educate people about what happened to Hiroshima. But the way the United States and the media portrayed it is look what we've done, you know, um, in a proud sense. And I'm, how could you be proud of this? You know, um, they were showing them in that sense. So I, I was very selective about the footage I showed. So if you're a filmmaker, you have that obligation and responsibility to not only your audience, but to the people who are being represented. And that is a, a very important factor. Um, are you representing them with respect? Are you representing them with grace? And when I say grace, that means that, does it lift up their story? Or are you just doing it for sensationalism? You know, because a lot of the issues that I tackle, domestic violence, domestic workers, you know, um, people who are incarcerated because of poverty, um, that those are issues that are very hard to hear. So, but it's harder for people to talk about it. Like the Hibaksha, um, Ogura-san was saying it took her 50 years to talk about her experience because she was living through the guilt and shame of being a survivor of the atomic yeah. bomb. So when you do a film, when you write about people's experiences, real social issues, um, it's, it's important to keep that compassion and that passion at the same time. Thank you so much. Uh, you, actually, um, I had the honor of uh, meeting uh, Oguda-san a couple months ago. And what I loved about her testimonial was, um, I've heard a couple over the years, but one thing she truly brought to light was the, the shame that was brought upon the Hibakusha initially. Cause you know, we fast forward now 78 years almost now. Uh, <laughs> it's like, oh, you know, they're very respected, very honored, but that wasn't how it was initially. It was. Uh, sadly, it was more like, oh, yeah, I don't know if you're the right type of person to be, you know, with my son or daughter. We don't yeah. want, you know, contaminated or whatever type of kids. You don't even know if, you know, you'll be able to have offspring for that matter or be around. Just like the, the language that was being, for, so she truly delved into those stories in her testimonial. And it was, it was, it was a nice eye opener. Like it was something that like I've kind of, you know, guessed about and but no one had ever truly talked about it. And so I I also appreciate like what is she's like in her 80s and she's like spitfire. Yeah. She's like <laughs> and just there doing her thing. And uh but yeah it was it was quite a treat and an honor to to share space and learn from her. Um uh, so thank you for capturing her in your documentary. Yeah. Looking forward to the other three stories. Um to be able to show that if I could find the funding and the time we would I mean, I'm I'm there Wonderful. the passion is still there the compassion is still there so thank you so much for having me and for the folks who came and yeah, thank you no, th thank you joy for allowing us to learn about your work I uh, truly appreciate you opening up about your experiences you know the lessons you've learned that some wisdom for future filmmakers and your kindness leadership uh, as we learn about this field further. And last but not least, I want to thank everyone who joined us today uh, and our continuous support out there um, for building a nuclear free world talk story. So thank you again, everyone. Great.
great. Have a great weekend. Aloha. 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 <laughs>